This morning I'm going to speak about the supernatural. I'm going to speak about healing and different things that go on in the life of Jesus and, and how we sometimes pursue it and pursue the wrong things and get things um, the wrong way around. But it's so good that the Lord would bring us a testimony this morning that can be scientifically proven that happened in our, in our region just up the road with Victory and, and Pastor Louis. And, and to testify to that is, is really exciting. So we'll get there though. So last week we looked at generosity and our attitude towards the things we own, if we actually own them or if they own us. And, and unpack C.S. Lewis where he said that we only are truly free from things when we're willing to give them away. doesn't say you have to give them away, but our attitude towards our stuff is kind of, it's just material stuff. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So everything we have, we didn't actually earn or, or get. It's a gift from God. It's a blessing from God meant to be stewarded for kingdom advancement. Um, and very often how we relate to things and, and uh, possessions we own connects us to the Father's heart, connects us to what God is doing in and around and through us. Um, and it protects us from, from finding and putting too much emphasis in the wrong things. Right, we looked at that last week. You can get it it's online. You can get, uh, watch the video. So today we're looking at, the, the, looking at spiritual keys for kingdom advancement, <laughs> compassion. Caring for others. That it's a crucial element of Christian behavior is how we engage and interact with one another. And, and it's one of the things that we both most struggle with. I think all the spiritual keys we kind of struggle with. Because when we're tired or frustrated or stressed out or whatever it is, we quickly become insular and self-focused rather than continually looking outwards. Right? Jesus continually in His ministry, no matter how tired He was, no matter how much time He wanted isolation, no matter what was going on in His life, always had time for other people. And when he had time for other people, what we'll see in Scripture again and again is where the power of the supernatural was released. We see it again where, where God showed compassion or when Jesus showed compassion, the Holy Spirit showed up to release the will of the Father in their lives. The feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the sick, again and again and again, it was a compassion that, that preempted any of the moving and the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And, and I encourage you, go read your whole Bible. That's a good encouragement. But go read your Bible. And when you read the life of Jesus and the miraculous works around the life of Jesus, underline every time the word is compassion is used and the moving of the miraculous, the moving of the supernatural that we see going on in Scripture. And there is, there's a lot of hunger in people today to see the supernatural. And I know as a Baptist church or, or historically Baptist, when we say supernatural, we get freaked out. And then someone's going to come up to me afterwards and say, well, the supernatural is not the nat supernatural. It's just the natural when the Spirit's involved. Um, yes, God has designed us to walk in spiritual things 100%. But, but there's, there's this real hunger for it that we can't just throw aside because traditionally or culturally or whatever it is, it doesn't suit our personalities. But don't worry. I'm with you this morning. Amen. Amen. So, so, and when I say supernatural, what am I speaking about? Because there's lots of different interpretations or understanding of the supernatural. Um, I'm speaking about the continual moving of the Holy Spirit to see people brought back into a right relationship with God um, and also see them the brokenness of humanity, both physically and emotionally restored. So I believe the supernatural is to restore hearts, brokenness, um, internal and external things that we see in Scripture. So both healings external and internally of our bodies, minds, and souls. That's what Jesus was about. That's what He came to restore and give life to the fullest and reconnect us with the Father. So we want God's continued moving in our lives in miraculous ways. And I think as believers, we should hunger for that. Where Paul says, do you desire these gifts? Do you hunger for the gifts? Do you hunger for the moving of the Spirit in your life to guide and direct you? Right? Um, and, and seeing people saved and discipled, and I've preached about it, should we pray for miracles? And it was probably about six, seven years ago, and the answer was yes, because the biggest miracle that takes place is our salvation. The fact that a, that a sovereign, powerful, all-holy, almighty God could look upon me and my filth and my sickness and my darkness and rescue and redeem me. That's the biggest miracle we should all be praying for continuously for those around us. But we still see in Scripture an outpouring and a manifestation of, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So as a church, we are continuationist. Big word, continuationist in our theology. Um, that's where we stand. We believe the same Holy Spirit that was active and present with the early church is the same Holy Spirit that is active and present with us as a community of believers. Um, you get different extremes of this. So you get sensationalists that believe all the gifts and the practices of the Spirit ceased um, with the disciples. And you get continuationists that believe that the same Spirit is evident in us today. On both sides of those, you get super extremes. 
I'm not arguing with anyone about extremes. I'm happy to go for coffee and we can chat through these things. Perhaps you can pay and buy cake. Um, um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But that's what we believe as a church. If you're wondering where does this church sit theologically with the Holy Spirit, we're continuous. We believe the same Spirit we read in the Bible is the same Spirit evident and active and present in us as believers today. Um, that all the miraculous is meant to reveal to us who God is and elicit a response of praise. So the Holy Spirit moves in order to show us who the greatness, the goodness, the mercy of the Father heart of God. And we would respond to that in praise. It would always respond in worship to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And although we see in Scripture, it's good to note, signs and wonders in Scripture alone did not save anyone. Right? There's those people that follow Jesus and they said, can't you do something else for us? And Jesus says, I can do everything for you, but I've already told you what you need to know. So the Scripture that says, do something, raise them from the dead so they can believe. And they said, if you haven't obeyed Moses, who plainly taught you the truth of God, the preaching of God, the proclamation of God, you're not going to believe even if I raise people from the dead. So we see there's not, the, the emphasis is never on the gifts as a means to be saved. Salvation is through Christ alone. Um, so we just need to be careful when we start with the supernatural that we don't put the wrong emphasis on it. There's a real danger we start to pursue signs and gifts instead of the gift giver. It was evidence around Jesus' time. It's evidence around our time that we just want what God can give us. We want the blessing, the goodness, the moving of the Holy Spirit. But we're not actually really cared about our own integrity, behavior, and character. Right? We always want what's given or, or promised, but we're not willing to do the work for it. Everyone wants a great, healthy marriage. Right? But we're not prepared to do the work for it. Everyone wants to be fit and healthy, but we're not prepared to wake up to go to gym. Everyone wants the moving of the Spirit and the goodness of God and the overboard blessing of God in our lives. We're not prepared to walk in union with God through community, through the Word. Right? And, and we run the risk of missing the miraculous when we're just looking for external things. They, I believe fully in all the external things. And that's why I love uh, Zalia shared this morning the testimony. Because it's so vital that God moves in miraculous ways. But we need to also understand the miraculous is taking a heart of stone and making it a heart of flesh. A heart that is selfish and self-centered and inward focused and moving it to actually care for others and walk with others and desire the best for others. Right? That even the air in our lungs is a mir miracle. Right? So, we, so we get to the, the meat of today though. The biblical pattern for the moving of the Spirit in our lives. How do we release, or one of the key ways to release the moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives to see the supernatural, to see the miraculous, to see both internally and externally restored to how God wants us. And what we'll see this morning, it's, 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 um, it's not a special prayer. It's not something we muster up with enough faith to see the miraculous taking place. There's no magic words that we can go, okay, well, Jesus said these words. If I say them, we're going to see the miraculous, Right? And now we're all disappointed because that would have been great. Imagine Jesus just say, said, say teacup and the Spirit would move. Right? And we don't see it in Scripture, but there is clear patterns we see in Jesus' life. And every time you see the moving of the Holy Spirit in believers' lives and in the early church, there's something that is present. Right? And it's our heart towards others. It's compassion. Our heart position and attitude towards others is what releases the work of the Holy Spirit in and around and through our lives. It's radical. So why can't I deal with sin? Because I don't care enough about others to deal with sin in my own life. Why can't I, I love more freely? Why can't I be empowered by the Holy Spirit to overcome? Because a lot of the times we're, we're more concerned about I want to deal with my issues rather than how can I love better. Right? Or we're too busy pointing out everyone else's fault. What we see is our heart position and attitude towards others is what releases the work of the Holy Spirit in and around and through our lives. Again and again. And go read scripture. There's scripture again and again. This is a biblical pattern we see that releases the, the mighty hand of God in our lives. And yet we, we don't walk in it enough. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22. It's a bit of a big chunk of scripture. We've got a few scriptures today. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22 from the NLT says, Dear brothers and sisters, Honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. Uh, it's not speaking about pastors there. It's speaking of anyone that's given a position of authority within um, a body of believers. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show the greatest respect and wholehearted love because of their work. So to show great respect and wholeheartedness, or show, it requires humility, it requires encouragement, it requires a heart positioning towards others that they would 
be praised. And live peacefully with each other. Live peacefully with each other, brothers and sisters. We urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is the will of God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Right, I often speak about the revealed will of God. What does God want me to do with my life? What does He have for me in my life? It's plain as day in Thessalonians there. Be kind, caring, seek peace, love others, sacrifice for others. Again and again and again. And, and, and what we see, and, and so those are all heart attitudes, right? You can't actually be kind and caring if your heart's not in it. You can't actually encourage others if it's all about yourself. So we see God's heart there is for us as believers is to be a loving people, a compassionate people, because it goes on in verse 19. And this is the consequences of not being compassionate. It says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. And that's why a lot of, we cannot throw aside what the Bible speaks about prophecies and, and words of knowledge and words of insight because of past hurts and experiences. And Thessalonians is saying, you, you test everything, right? You don't, just because I stand up here and say I'm a prophet, doesn't mean you have to believe what I'm saying. It says, test everything. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Paul, war, Paul warns us here that our interactions with one another, our attitude towards one another, may quench the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Right? I don't know if you've ever seen that. Or When you are more self-centered, when you're selfish, when you don't want to love and care, there's, a, there's a, a hindrance of the Spirit flowing in our lives. Right? It's like being on blood transfusion and you keep standing on the, the hose that feeds you your blood. I don't know what it's called, right? Or in oxygen and you keep clamping it and you, you, you can't understand why you can't get out of this, this rut. You can't get out of these problems. You can't get air in your lungs. You're just trying and it's there and the tank's there, but you keep standing on the pipe. And the machine keeps flashing and saying something's wrong. And you're like, Lord, why is nothing happening in my life? And what we see is because our attitude and our position towards God um, and people directly affect the moving of the Spirit in our lives. Which is the Spirit is the one that sustains us, that guides us, that empowers us to live out this Christian life that He's had. And without compassion, without a care for other people, we, we become self-centered and limit the moving of the Spirit in our lives. Paul tells us what attitude we are supposed to have in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 8. And we started at the beginning of the series, how do we act more like Jesus? How do we walk more with Jesus? How do we know more of Jesus? Philippians 2, 5 to 8 says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ had. Though he was God, which means he had all equality, all power, all prestige, all privilege, everything. Right? And none of us are even close to the, the, the level of God. Christ had all of that. He did not think of equality with God, something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Same attitude of Christ as humble, loving, serving, and, com uh, and, and compassion. And what we see in Christ's behavior towards those that are broken and destitute and, and distraught is there was no one beneath Christ that he, to whom he would serve. Right? Because we, we, we've spoken about, I've spoken about, when we do something long enough, we think we move beyond the point of needing to do it. Right? So I've done this for 10 years. Now it's someone else's turn. I've done this for 10 And it's good. I'm not talking about not handing roles over. That's fine. But very often what we're quick to relinquish when, I, when we increase is those that are serving, loving, compassionate roles, if we're honest in our own lives. Right? How did engage, Jesus engage with people, with the broken, with the sinful, with the outcasts, with those that no one wanted to touch, right? The, those that, that smell bad, that walk in the streets, that we want nothing to do with. How did Jesus engage with them? Right? With compassion, again and again and again. And lives were changed because of the compassion Jesus showed to them, which released the moving of the Spirit in their lives. We cannot have a changed community if we do not have a compassionate community. We cannot have a changed community if we do not have a compassionate community. Right? When, Jesus, when we look at Jesus' life and ministry and the moving of the Holy Spirit again and again, it's compassion. And when we speak about the supernatural, we're speaking about the will of God playing out on earth. Right, we've said it. When we say as a church and we sing, Lord, come Holy Spirit or Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Right, what we're saying, according to Scripture, one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to enact the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit never works outside of the instruction of the Father. 
which is crucial to understand. The Holy Spirit always works in line with the Scripture. So you'll never get a message from Scripture that is, or a message from the Holy Spirit that is not in line with Scripture. So that's a good way to test. Is the Holy Spirit leading me to do this? Is the Holy Spirit prompting me for this action or this action or this generous? Whatever? It will always align with Scripture again and again. One of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit in Scripture is to enact the will of the Father. God's will for us is redemption, is wholeness, is completeness, is restored in Christ Jesus. We know that's the will of the Father. We know death only entered when sin entered. The death was never God's will for us as individuals. Although we will all die and go to heaven, like Renee said, I loved it. What's the worst that can happen to us? We die, which is actually not that bad. Where Paul writes, so death, where's your sting? Right, as believers, we can be encouraged by that. Death, where's your sting? Right, yes, there's those loved ones we leave behind, there's the responsibility, but death, where's your sting? Because I'll be in the presence of God in His hand and might, and no one will hold my family tighter than God will when I'm gone. And that's my reassurance. I'm always like, no, my family needs me. No, my family needs God. I'm just a bonus that they get for now. They're not yes, I can say that. <laughs> um, and, and, and we see that it's the moving of God, right? It's the, the, so the Holy Spirit enacts the will of the God. So is there a pattern we see in Jesus' behavior or heart response to a situation that creates a platform for the Holy Spirit to move? And Romans 2.4 gives us insight to God's heart. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that the kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? So how does God engage a sinful nation with kindness and love and peace and patience and long-suffering, which turns our hearts in repentance to the moving of the Spirit in our lives. Again and again, we see it's love, it's patience, it's kindness, it's a position of service towards others that turns God's heart back to, it turns our hearts back to God. Right? God is always about the heart. That's what I love this series, right? This series of spiritual keys of kingdom advancement. Because God is looking at our hearts. Right? There's no way you can fake compassion. There's no way you can fake generosity. There's enough stories in the Bible that says um, that God knows your heart, that He looks at your giving, He looks at your attitude towards things. Right? We can pretend all we want with the external, and God looks straight at the heart again and again and says, that's the problem. But through the work of the Holy Spirit, through our obedience, this beautiful mystic match of the Holy Spirit and, and our responsibility and God's sovereignty and the Word of God, we start to see Him empowering us to live it out. And here's the issue, right? If you want to be compassionate... You need to deal with your issues. If you want, and I, and I mean this lovingly, if you want to be a compassionate people that sees the working of the Holy Spirit in your life, you need to work on your issues. Right? We need to be ready to deal with our own heart issues. We will limit the moving of the Holy Spirit if we will not accept responsibility for our own faults, if we will not accept that who this, how we are acting is not of God. Because, yes, God pours out His blessings sometimes irrespective of us because God is good and gracious. But there needs to be a dealing of our own issues if we're wanting to see the moving of the Spirit in our lives and the empowering of God in our lives. Because what happens, and you can testify in your own lives where there's been a sin that's been identified that you won't deal with, right? It pulls you further and further away from the Father's presence. Again and again and again. I can guarantee you that. There's never been an identified heart issue in your life that you've ignored that hasn't snowballed and, and affected your walk with God. Given enough time, this, the, the, the hymn says, we're prone to wonder from the one we love. But the issue is, it's, it's a compassion issue, that we care more about ourselves and self-preservation than we do for the moving and the redemptive, miraculous power to save people. So we just make it all about us. And we believe, again, the Holy Spirit is working in accordance to God's will in you. It's not a power you possess. It's the, the, the power of the gospel through you to change and transform lives. The analogy, and I think I actually got it from Alpha, but I can't remember, is your gifting, your skill set, your walk with God is, is like a toy that requires batteries. Right? And the Holy Spirit is the battery. And all toys that have, take batteries are designed to operate on an external power source. That's why some of you are here this morning and you're tired and you're frustrated because you've been running on your own power source like a little hamster on, on a wheel and it's not going anywhere and you're tired, you're frustrated and you're getting angry with God, you're getting angry with the church, you're getting angry with everything but you haven't actually plugged into Christ, you've plugged into yourself of self-preservation which we all do, there's periods of our lives we all do that, right? 
And, and, and the Holy Spirit this morning, and God is saying this morning, connect to the right power source. Get off the wheel and plug it in. There's no ESCOM in the kingdom. Amen. <laughs> it's not going to have load shedding. God is sufficient. God is powerful. And we've looked at the difference between compassion and concern. And we saw Jesus is compassionate way before his concern. Concern is, concern is passive about people, about situations, but it never leads to action. We're all concerned for the coronavirus, but none of us are actually doing anything right now. Because there's no compassion which leads to action. Compassion activates in our hearts a desire to get involved. We, we, I've said it. There's areas in our lives where the Holy Spirit convicts, whether that, there's marriages or our attitudes or whatever it is, and we just leave it because there's no desire. We're all concerned for our marriages. We're not compassionate about our marriages. We're concerned about the sin that I allowed to fester in my, my, my life, but you know what? There's no compassion to do anything about it. Concerned about our health, but unless that concern turns into compassion for ourselves and for others, we're not going to do anything about it. Cost too much, sacrifice too much, too humbling, whatever it is, right? So we just stay the course and miss out of the adventure of loving people, of loving God, of, of serving people. We miss out of the empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we are not moved by the Father's heart towards us and others. And, and you know what I love about compassion? It's not even, compassion reminds us that God still remembers our name. Because how many of you have been a Christian for 10, 15, 20, 30 years and you feel God saved you and He's just forgotten you? And then all of a sudden He'll bring someone across your path that needs loving kindness and concern and you realize still how far of a journey you've still got to go with the Lord to be loving, kind, and compassionate. But I find the Lord's just putting His finger on your heart saying, I still remember you, my child. It's been 30 years, but I've never forsaken you. I've never given up. I've taken you this far, and we're going to get through this next journey together. Compassion reminds us that God hasn't forgotten us. As believers, we need to know that because we, we think we've moved beyond this point where, where there's just so many people, so many new issues, so many things going on which are loud and upfront, and, and, and God still quietly brings people across our paths that we would show compassion that He reminds us, I haven't forgotten the work. I'm still busy in you. Right? Compassion doesn't accept a person's circumstances as okay and actively works towards changing them. It fights this internal urge that says people get what they deserve, right? You know, people get what they deserve. Oh, they, they deserve that. They made poor choices, whatever it is. This internal um, urges that secretly rejoices at other people's hardship and failures, right? We know, you don't have to put up your hand. We know that's how, how the human heart works. Rejoicing that the government fails again and again because it just proves that we were right and they were wrong. Rejoicing that your nemesis at school actually is getting divorced, or that sucks to, to be him, but you're still happily married. Rejoice that, okay, church finances are looking good, but other church finances aren't looking so good. Well, then we've got the favor of the Lord, yeah, and no one else does. You don't have to put up your hands if I've hit it most. But that's how we think sometimes when it comes to other people, other churches, other believers, other uh, whatever it is. Right? The compassion helps us fight a selfish, inward-focused monologue in our brains. Because none of us got what we deserve. None of, if you're sitting here today, you got Jesus. Amen. We all should have gone to hell. We all should be dead right now. But we got the full life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Compassion means someone else's heartbeat becomes your heartbeat. Someone else's life story, you, you journey with them, not in a way that overwhelms, but in a way that allows us to be an on-ramp for the Holy Spirit to inject Himself into people's lives. We are not called to be saviors, but companions. Right? We're not called to be saviors, we're called to be companions. It's, it's radically different. Right? Whenever we do weddings, and I'm sure I've spoken about it before, I, I tell the people, your partner is awesome, they're not your savior, Jesus is. Your partner is your companion. Because companionship, you can build friendship, you can build moving forward together. When you're trying to save the other person or looking to be saved in that person, they cannot sustain that. None of us, we might have savior complexes, but, but that's not what we're designed for. We're designed for companionship. Compassion reminds us of the companionship that Christ came to re redeem and restore. We call we are God's vessels. 2 Timothy 2, 20, 21. 
In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver and some are made of wood and clay. There are expensive utensils used for special occasions and the cheap ones for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, so if you pursue God, you honor God, you're obedient to God, you want the best for, for yourself and for others, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Right? Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Compassion reminds us that God can use us. Compassion prepares us to be used for God. Right? We read scripture, it's not, will God use me? No, God will use you. The question is when? Will you be prepared? Will you be prepared to walk in compassion and love to those God brings across your path? Compassion for the world leads us to want to live in a way that others would know God personally. It leads us to want to deal with our own sins, whatever the cost, so that others may know the freedom that we have. Right? And, and Matthew 9, 35 to 38 is, is um, the compassion again of Jesus. Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Jesus, Jesus traveled through the, all the towns and villages in that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. Right? And healed every kind of disease and illness. Again, really good study if you want to go. There's, pro there's always proclamation of the word and then demonstration of the kingdom. Right? So Jesus preaches the gospel. It's not just let's just have healing or whatever it is. Then that takes place as we see. It's a proclamation. This is who God is. This is His holiness, His sovereignty. It's who we are. And from that, there's a demonstration of the power of the kingdom. So preaching and demonstration of the kingdom. When we saw... so. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd, he said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the, the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. It was, what was the one thing that activated God's, God's uh, preaching? And, and even preaching is because we're concerned for others. So what activated Jesus' preaching and demonstration of the kingdom? It was his compassion he had for the lost. Again and again, we see the supernatural released when there's compassion. And I believe more now than ever, compassion is practiced and not something we feel. Compassion, when you say, I just don't care anymore. I just don't want to do anything anymore. I just want to sit at home and sulk and be alone. It's where we step out in faith and walk in compassion towards others. How much compassion is enough? Just one more day. Just one more. Right? Because that's the example Jesus sets. Compassion is never convenient and will cost you something. We see that. We need to see as Jesus sees. We cannot follow Jesus and be passive about our faith. It's not an option in Scripture. And as someone said this week, I read, it says, We need to see as Jesus saw and feel as Jesus felt so that we will do as Jesus did. Compassion personalizes things. That's why I love compassion because it moves it from this idea of, of a them and us, of there and here, to one-on-one -on -one engagement with people. Jesus sees people. He doesn't see issues. It's personal. It's, it, it, it is a person. It's a situation. It's an interaction. Compassion. Right? And, and two stories. We're, we're almost nearing the end. Good intentions mean nothing in the kingdom. I've preached about that. I've spoken about it. It's about actually getting stuff done in the power of the Spirit to release the working of the Spirit, to see people saved. Um, it's where your hands and feet move that will matter. Right, a, a really interesting story about they took 40 um, people studying to be pastors. And they said, come for an interview. We want to interview um, you about something, about the course or whatever it is. Come to this church. Um, and, and to a whole bunch of them, they actually said, you must come and share on the Good Samaritan. So they were trying to trick them and give them a heads up. And what they did, they hired an actor to go lay outside or along the path that they'd all have to walk past. And as soon as these students walked past, the actor would then lie down and groan a bit and make some noise and make enough noise that the people would see. And more than half of these aspiring pastors walked, just stepped over him and carried on going um, and, and, and went and finished whatever it is, right? And, and we tend to think, if we're honest, as I shared the story, um, number one, you're thinking, don't trust pastors, which is fine. Um, number two, how could, how could students of the gospel, even sharing on the Good Samaritan, miss an opportunity to practice the gospel? Right? And we say, I would never do that. I would never. I, <laughs> I'd never ignore someone in need. And Jesus says, really? Right? The other issue is we want, we want 
God to tell everyone else to be compassionate, not us. We want to make whatever our holy discontent is, whatever keeps us up at night, whatever stirs us to action, we want God to solve through everyone else. And He's looking at us and saying, I've called you to step and walk in compassion. Because the students like us, right, are, are preoccupied with themselves, with what they've got to get done. They had to get the talk done. They had this interview. They had whatever it is, right? They were maybe thinking, this will set my future. So they were concerned with what the future had, that they just ignored um, what God was doing, right? We've got life, children, making it to church at time, whatever it is. They didn't see the obvious need of the person in front of them. And they did not stop to help him. They didn't see him as Jesus sees, saw him. Jesus continu continuously saved people and saw people for who they were, broken people in need of love, kindness, and concern. Compassion was the platform which the Holy Spirit moved to restore and refresh and encourage people. Last story. And I read it this week, but it happened a long time ago when there were still phone booths. And it is a sad story, but it, it proves the point in how we can be compassionate. A, a young father, his name was James Lee, um, phoned a reporter from a tavern phone booth, and he, and he phoned her, and he, and he said, I've sent you a letter that it's going to explain my story. It's in the post. Um, I'm going to kill myself. This is the end of it. And, and, and he put down the phone, and he shot himself dead in the phone booth. Um, the, the phone operator quickly panicked, whatever, tried to trace the call, got the call, found out where he was, and when they arrived, it was too late, he was dead. And, and in the man's pocket was this little crayon drawing um, that, that, and a note saying, I would like to be buried with this note. Um, buried with this note, and, the, and his daughter's name, I think, was, was Shirley. She, she drew on it, and it was, love, Dad, Shirley, love you. Um, and, and, and as the, the story unfolds, it happened that the, the girl's, the, or his wife died when the girl was two years old, and five months prior to, to the phone booth incident, the little daughter died in a fire at the home. So he had lost everything. He had no family, he had nothing. He actually asked strangers to attend his funerals, his daughter's funeral, just so there would be people there to, to celebrate her life. Um, and, and this goes on, and, and before he, he hung up, he, he said to the operator, I felt so alone, and as if, and, and though I had no one, right? And we hear that heartbreaking story, and we all think to ourselves, well, if only I was there, if only I had seen him, if only I had crossed paths with him. But the reality of the situation, and what they point out in the whole article, is that hurting people don't have neon signs that say, I'm hurting. Right? Hurting people, broken people, sad people, um, depressed people don't have a sign that says, I'm hurting, I need help. They look like you and me. The reality is week in, week out, as a church, we have people that are broken and hurting and in need of compassion, in need of love, in need of words of encouragement. But very often we step over them to get to our friends, to greet our friends, or speak to people we know, or, or whatever it is, right? Because we've all stuck in the cycle of life that we're just trying to get through the day, right? And I, and I know I'm there sometimes. I come and I'm overwhelmed or whatever. I'm just trying to get through the day. Just get through Sunday. It's fine. Let's keep going. And we, and we miss people that are hurting because we're so self-centered on self-preservation, which is an excuse to, to be self-centered in loving and caring for other people. Hurting people do not wear neon signs. When we engage with each other with Jeffreys Bay this week, hurting people, there's no neon sign that says this person needs love, this person needs engagement, this person needs equality and respect. Right? And, and compassion does not equate to financial giving. Right? Let me just clarify that. So just because someone needs compassion, they need equality, they need love, they need worth, they need to be treated as a human being, even if you don't give them money. And even if it turns a bit hazardous because you won't give them money, that's fine. But we need to be compassionate to people. We need to be kind to people. Compassion takes steps of faith to move, to, to move forward. And we have compassion we move from with just a voice in the crowd to the hands and feet of Jesus. And what we see, and that's why compassion is a true mark of a, of a mature believer. And I said we want the supernatural, but let's not put the supernatural before the horse. The promise of Scripture is the supernatural is with us. It will move. We will see healings. We will see the miraculous. We will see marriages saved and, and sight restored and all these things set free. But it will come when we as a people take God seriously to love one another. 
but I love that we'll know we are disciples we, when we take seriously to extend peace and forgiveness and, and generosity towards one another as a community of believers. That's when we will see, without a doubt, the moving of the Spirit because our attitudes are aligned with the Father's heart. We cannot see the compassion or we cannot have the compassion or the moving of the Spirit without first dealing with our own insecurities, our own hurts and pains that need to be dealt with in the presence of Jesus. So, we walk, so if we are called to walk in footsteps of Jesus, we are called to have compassion to those around us. So as the band comes up, I'm going to close in prayer. Um, if anyone needs prayer for anything, maybe, you're, you know, maybe there's two sides. Maybe it's, Lord, help me be more compassionate. Lord, that's why I love that Hosanna song we sung. It said, break my heart with what breaks yours. Maybe that's your prayer and you want to come forward for that prayer. Maybe you're on the other side of the scale um, today and when I spoke about that hurting individual when I spoke about brokenness and hurt and, and, and whatever it is maybe you just need to come forward for some encouragement and prayer from whoever's up front this morning so it's a free space it's a family space up front that anyone is welcome for prayer you don't have to feel ashamed or whatever it is sometimes all we can do is step forward in faith and say yes Lord here I am so I'm going to close in prayer and then we're going to sing and then yeah, uh, a couple of minutes and we'll have our meeting. So let's, yeah, let's pray and sing. Yes, Lord, we just come before you this morning. We thank you ultimately for your compassion towards us. We thank you that you are good and gracious and loving towards us. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your long suffering. We thank you that no one, yeah, gets what we deserve. We deserve eternity apart from the presence of our Father. <coughs> eternity apart from who Jesus is. And you paid the price that we could know you. So we say thank you for that, Lord. And this morning, Lord, if we're here and we're wrestling through our own sinful nature, our own inward focus, Lord, that you would just break our heart with what breaks you. Lord, give us a heart for the lost. Give us a heart for the destitute. Give us a heart for those that just need you, Lord. Not just a concerning heart, but a compassionate heart. Lord, we pray that you would work in line with the patterns we see in Scripture, that when we show compassion, true, genuine compassion, your Spirit would meet us there. Your Spirit would go before us. And Lord, lastly, if, you, if we're here this morning and you're just broken, you're hurting and there's no neon sign you don't want to put up a sign but you just want to say Lord I'm hurting that you would come forward for prayer to be encouraged by the ministry team and Lord we thank you that at the foot of the cross the ground is level you say all are welcome here because of the price I've paid all are welcome at the foot of the cross so Lord we, as we sing I give my all to you Lord we give our all to you again break our hearts with what breaks yours Lord lead us in the things that are of you, we pray, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.